So I'm going to talk about PDE, and many of you know about PDE, which is unusual for a deep learning conference. Uh, so here we go. We're going to use ideas from partial difference, differential equations, first typo, uh, to improve deep neural nets for the following aspects. Uh, robustness to adversarial attacks, generalizability, uh, architecture divine, uh, design. And my favorite is an optimization algorithm. So the punchline of this thing is going to be a very, very trivial looking change of gradient descent, uh, which has lots of nice properties and is based on uh, ideas coming from PDE. So that's the punchline. Uh, other applications include security. What is deep learning? Well, deep learning is a revolution, and you hear the footsteps every day in the hallway. Uh, this is what students want to work on. They don't want to do uh, fluid dynamics, or applied math has changed dramatically, more than anything I've ever seen in my life, anybody's life, actually, uh, in such a short time. I think it's interesting. I hope it's a good thing. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> here it is. So neural networks, there's the architecture. Uh, deep learning is part of a broad family of machine learning methods based on learning representations. Typically, you use deep neural nets, which are compositions of very, very simple functions. And one of the biggest breakthroughs, for example, was the chain rule, which is backpropagation, which shows you the level at which this uh, stuff is developed. Uh, some important ne uh, neural nets architectures are listed below. Uh, ResNet is my favorite, which you will see soon, in which you actually solve an ODE instead of using a general dynamical system, and that gives you a much better landscape. Okay. So this is propaganda, the success of deep learning, the fa facial ID, uh, autonomous cars, AlphaGo, ART, and so on. And as was shown yesterday, the, the results, for example, in computer vision were revolutionary. The subject has changed amazingly in a, few, a very, very short time, since 2012, roughly, when all this uh, stuff happened. There was a uh, winter of deep learning, which was in Montreal, which is a good place for a, a winter, uh, and which uh, that's where a lot of great stuff was incubating. Uh, so let's take an example, which is adversarial vulnerability. Yeah, deep neural nets are unstable to adversarials. So I don't know. This is a good audience for this stuff because you guys are not, have not been beaten over the head with this as much as many other audiences. So on the left, you can say there's a panda, and that's what uh, you will get if you use the, the proper architecture. And then in the center, you add this uh, strange-looking noise, which it tries to fool you. And by adding that little bit of noise, you get uh, something on the right, which looks like a panda. And it will be classified as a gibbon. Uh, and this is a classic example. So by adding this perturbation, you can fool a deep, you can fool a deep neural net. And this is something we want to do something about, so let's talk about that a little bit in the beginning. Any questions? No. So there are adversarial attacks. So one is the fast gradient sign method, where you, <coughs> you add something to push you towards a panda. That's the first equation, uh, where you add epsilon times the signum of that gradient. Uh, the other one is the fast gradient sign method, where you push it towards some target you want. You subtract epsilon times this gradient of a target. Uh, this time will be a gibbon. And these iterated fast gradient sign methods are just repeating this stuff and thresholding. And this is super classical. This is not our work at all. This has been around, I guess, Goodfellas started it. Uh, so something should be done about this. Uh, and we'll try to do something about it. There's some theoretical results about adversarial attacks which tell you that what you saw is what's going to happen. I will skip the mathematics. It's very simple. So here's some equations which are in our paper. It's not a big deal. 
Uh, basically, it does what it's supposed to do. It increases the loss in the first case, and it decreases the loss in the second case, just as you would like, and you can prove some things about it, which are not that hard to do. So the question is, what do you do about it? And we will talk about that later. Okay. So let's talk about now where PDEs and so on come into this stuff and differential equations. And the ideas are very simple in many cases, as follows. Yeah. So ResNet, uh, the big deal about ResNet is when you do the architecture, you can think of it as a dynamical system where xk plus 1 is equal to f of x previous and so on and so on. And ResNet is the magnificent idea of viewing it as an ODE. And this made this guy a millionaire and uh, had a huge number of citations. And basically, you replace the plane net, which is xi plus 1 is equal to a function g of xi by xi plus 1 minus xi plus f of xi is what you're updating. So this is very sensible to anybody who knows anything about differential equations. This is a first order forward Euler discretization of a differential equation. And that has many, many advantages. There's something called the landscape when you do gradient descent for a non-convex problem. The landscape is much better when you view it as an ODE. Okay? I mean, this, is, this is a very, very simple idea. But this paper has God knows how many citations and has caused uh, a big improvement in performance. Okay. So it's a lot easier to learn F than to learn a general G. And once you start thinking in terms of differential equation, lots and lots of things happen. It turns out there's a huge link between uh, neural nets and solving these problems and getting the uh, right parameters and control theory. Uh, and that's an old idea, but it's made much more precise by this simple, simple, simple change of variables. Okay. So ResNet, it goes as follows. Uh, for any x hat with the label y, you propagate by xk plus 1 is xk plus f of xk wk. And at the end, you get uh, the predicted label. And it's something called soft max, which I won't tell you. It's a function that uh, is supposed to help you predict the label. Uh, so what you can do is re regard xk as x at time t. And believe it or not, this is a new notion. This was a new notion when this was done, I think, uh, by what's his name, he. And, and when that, once that happens, a lot of, lot of things open up that are related to differential equations. Of course, these f's are not simple things. They are complicated functions that you use to create the architecture. But nevertheless, you can think of it as a forward Euler discretization of an ordinary differential equation where you're given a value at f, and you want to find the differential equation that got you there. It's as simple as that. And there are parameters that you want to fill in that are missing, and they you wind up by doing some kind of optimization to get those parameters. That's, the way, that's a nice way of looking at all this. Okay. So you get one more time. t is k over l. And you can regard xk as x of tk. And you just put a delta t in your brain before f hat and think about an ODE. All right? And think about ODE whose coefficients that we are trying to figure out. Um, and they are, they are constrained to lie in some set. And we do optimization to find out what they are by looking at what happens at f of x of 1 and fitting it to the data. And that, in a nutshell, is more or less uh, how deep learning works, actually. Uh, and it's a big improvement over what happened before because we didn't have the delta t times f. Okay. Very, very simple idea. Okay. So basically, from a numerical discretization point of view, it's just forward Euler discretization of an ODE. So dx dt is equal to some f hat, and that's what you want to find, because f hat depends on w. Uh, x of 0 is given. That's the training data. And y is f of x1 is what you want to get to. 
And by fitting all this stuff together, you find W. This is a nice, compact way of thinking about deep learning, in my opinion. And I'm, it's not uh, universal. This defines the character, for this audience, this is trivial. This defines the characteristic equations of a first order transport equation. Uh, du dt plus f dot grad u equals zero, my favorite equation practically. Things propagate along characteristics. The characteristics here are crazy because f is to be found and involves all kinds of nonlinear dropout, weird uh, thresholding, crazy things. Nevertheless, that's what you're looking for. And <clears throat> u of x zero is equal to u of x one. It propagates along the characteristics. If you enforce the terminal condition at t equals one, then you have u of x zero is f of x of one, and you try to fit the w's to make that happen. That is the idea. Very simple idea, but revolutionary in some crazy sense. So one more time, the, uh, the forward propagation of ResNet can be modeled as computing u along the characteristics with u of x1 given. Back propagation is the chain rule. And it was wonderful to hear uh, Jitendri say yesterday that the chain rule was rebelled against by uh, neuroscientists because human brains don't work that way. But I don't care. <laughs> and we shouldn't care. So back propagation, which is one of the most revolutionary things, is the chain rule, by God. So we have forward Euler and the chain rule. These are incredible notions introduced in this subject. Okay? So back propagation and training ResNet is find the velocity field for a given W. Uh, sorry, uh, finding W for a given form of F. For the F is given in some crazy form with u of x of 1 given f, and u of xi is equal to, at 0, is given. These are the labels. So you have to enforce the, the initial condition on the training data. And in and so doing that, you figure out what w is. And then you uh, do great things with deep learning. And there are great things being done, so you cannot ignore this stuff. It's maddening. You know, some of these beautiful algorithms that have devised, been devised in recent years might have been ignored if they'd happened later because deep learning subsumes everything, or many things. It's frightening. Okay. So here's some, uh, now we begin with some of our contributions to all this. One is NRESNet. This is a joint work with Bao Wang, who is responsible for these slides and did a great job, and uh, other collaborators using Feynman Katz formalism. Okay. So what we have, what you saw before, was a hyperbolic equation with crazy coefficients operating in an insanely high number of dimensions. So there's a limit to what you can do with PDEs. You cannot solve the heat equation in an insane number of dimensions because you just can't do it. Uh, the feynman katz thing is an approximation to a heat equation type regularization of what I just said. And it's very easy to implement, and it does, has the property of smoothing these coefficients and giving you better results. So this is a new idea that we've introduced. And this, for those of you who actually program this stuff, this is easy. This is something you can do. This is not a big change in your algorithm. Let's talk about it. I'm going too fast, so ask questions or snore or do something. Uh, so what you want to do is control the smoothness of the decision boundary. So in the transport equation model, u of x0 is the decision function. That's where you classify the data. It could be singular and not robust to an adversarial attack. Well, and again, we're looking for w in that equation, f of xw. So we add a viscosity term to smooth this decision function. And we're solving a heat equation starting at, at uh, t equals 1 and going backwards. That's why it's a positive coefficient. And that's going to give you smoothing if you can do it. But if you can do it, you are uh, living in a dream world. You can't solve parabolic equations in very, very high dimensions. So instead of doing that, we use the feynman katz formula, which gives you u of x0 is the expectation, written this way. And you, uh, you, you <coughs> so you can approximate solving the heat equation just by adding noise. It's crude, but it works. It's as simple as that. Uh, 
So instead of solving the heat equation in a million dimensions, or whatever dimensions we have, we want a few um, uh, sol uh, uh, solutions to the first equation up there, starting at t equals 1, with the data given at f, and trying to fit it to the initial data by adding, by adding noise and running this thing, and averaging a few of these. And the results are very good, actually. So you add Gaussian noise to residual mapping, and then you average over multiple jointly trained ResNets. And don't be alarmed, averaging over two or five, whatever, gives you a big improvement right there, uh, numerically, as you will see. So for example, in the adversarial robustness thing we were talking about, you don't have to understand the exact the statement of the problem, basically, uh, you maximize the error in that stuff in brackets, and then you minimize the expected uh, value, and you compare uh, that epsilon parameter we used before for uh, ResNet 20, 24, 44, uh, and so on, and we use 10 iterations, and the graph should, surely, should clearly show that ResNet improves a lot by adding this re regularization. So if, again, those of you who are using ResNet, this, I promise you, is easy to do. I'm not asking you to give up anything sac sacred. Just run backward Euler, sorry, run the parabolic equation. Uh, you, instead of reversing, the, using the chain rule precisely or back propagation, run the, run the equation backward with noise initially and average a few of these things. And the results really improve things. Okay. So that is, this is no commitment, money back guarantee. Uh, just try it and let's see what happens. Okay. That's our, that's our first newish algorithm right there. Next is something which is a little more of a commitment, uh, but it's something that I really like. Uh, and this comes from in-painting and image processing. Uh, one of the, I mean, image processing is, of the type I love, is unfortunately dying out because of this crazy deep learning stuff. But there are still interesting new algorithms, and this is one of them. So one of the things I did with uh, Professor Shi from uh, Tsinghua is uh, interpolating data and filling in missing data. Take a picture of Barbara, though many of you know what that means. Remove some points and just have a sub-sampled thing and interpolate in the, in the best way possible. And so we have what we think is a good way of doing that. We're going to use that here, basically, in this uh, deep learning stuff. So we're going to use interpolating function as the output activation. So what you typically do for deep neural nets with softmax act, 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 sorry, activation uh, is the loss function involves the softmax. And if you don't know what it is, I'll tell you offline. It's a simple function. Uh, and then you compute the error, and you backpropagate, and you hope uh, that uh, you get the right Ws once you fit it to the initial data. That's what it amounts to, or the points that you know. So instead of doing that, and this is a commitment, this is something you have to believe that is going to help you. Uh, but if you're starting from scratch, it's doable. What we're going to do is, again, down below, back propagation is the chain rule. There it is. So uh, you use the chain rule based on soft max, and that there are formulas to make that all easy. It's been worked out by many people, and it all works. Okay. So what do we do? We use an interpolating function as the output activation. That means instead of the last step being fitting to the soft max function, we're going to fit it. Uh, oops, I went backwards, sorry. Here it is. We're going to use data dependent activated function. So we have initial data that, we, that uh, these are the samples that we are given. And what we do is interpolate that by using a weighted Laplacian, non-local Laplacian, okay? 
we use a weighted non-local Laplacian. We solve Laplacian equation, Laplace's equation with weights uh, having to do, in this case, with the exponential, uh, the weight function is the exponential of a distance divided by sigma squared. Uh, so if you have only a small amount of data being given, look at equation 11. You minimize the durational energy of equation 10 to begin with, uh, with some weights with boundary data given at isolated points. Okay, Th these are papers we wrote a few years ago. There are many, many papers written on uh, weighted non-local Laplacian. It's, an, it's not a brand new idea. It's a way of interpolating data by obviously fitting a solution to Laplace's equation, which the data points are given at crazy points, and try to fit in the missing data. It turns out that that doesn't work very well unless you do special things at the points at which you know the true solution. Okay. So the key step is, uh, the key equation here is you do Euler-Lagrange equations on this Dirichlet energy. The weights involve distance between points. You have a set of points in a high dimensional manifold. You have a labeled tiny subset, a small subset. You only have a small of data, amount of data being given. And you add a balanced factor to the variational derivative, which means that you weight those points that you know more. Very, very simple idea. That x divided by xte means that you have a big number uh, when you know the data. So you solve this thing, which is not hard to do, even in high dimensions. And this takes your initial data and defines it throughout space. And that's what you use for the fitting in the last step, not softmax. So this is, a, again, those of you who program this stuff, this is a commitment. It's not that big a commitment, but it's, uh, and it gives you very improved results in many cases. In particular, many of the problems you guys have been talking about are relatively small compared to this crazy stuff in uh, other fields. So this is doable. Okay. So the key equation is 11, where you are, from 10 to 11, you do, a very, you do the Euler-Lagrange equation of this thing, and you wind up uh, with an interpolation of the uh, training data. And that's what you fit. You fit an interpolant of the training data uh, to what you got. And that helps you get the right Ws. And that's the basic idea. Now, there are some issues here that are really not trivial. The chain rule, for example, the dreaded chain rule, uh, backpropagation. Your backpropagation and interpolant of an uh, elliptic equation, so that's uh, a commitment like crazy. So here's the, uh, what we're doing. We are uh, training and testing these things with the soft max as output layer. And we cheat. Instead of actually doing backpropagation on uh, the true loss, we do some linearization. Oops, going the wrong direction. Uh, and the linearization is a commitment, uh, but it seems to work. So I won't go through the details, but that's a, that's a, a non-trivial step. But to give you the idea of, of the success, let's look at the numbers. OK, so here is uh, uh, accuracy versus uh, of, of vanilla uh, versus uh, WNLL. Uh, you can see in uh, B, we do vanilla at first, and we stop. And then we switch over to WNLL, and then we bop up. So that's the upper right. Uh, and it's, uh, and uh, same thing is true for upper left. And in particular, uh, this works well when there's a small amount of data known. Uh, where it really is a big improvement. We can look at numbers, for example. And some of the numbers are really good. I mean, for example, on CIFAR, which is a classic simple case, if you look at uh, ResNet 110, where the heck is Anyway, you can see it over there someplace. Uh, the error goes from 43% to 28% with uh, 1,000 instances of training. So again, uh, it's, it's arrogant to come in here and say you should do, change what you're doing. And most of what I tell you to do to change will be very easy. This is a non-trivial change, uh, but it's doable and it gives you a big improvement. So one more time, you fit, it's a, it's a control theory problem. You have data in the beginning, 
you interpolate the blasted data. That's what you're trying to get at the end. And you're trying to figure out what coefficients will get you there. Very simple. And instead of using, uh, uh, instead of fitting some other function, you fit the interpolant at the last step. Any questions about this? But if this is true, then you should be able to, on the standard data set, when you have fewer training examples, you should improve performance. You mean fewer should help? No, no, no. Yeah. And this approach should come yeah. in to give a special advantage when you have relatively few examples. Exactly. Nope. We have not done that. We, we are poor mathematicians working in some uh, corner. And so from a realistic point of view, we haven't tried it, but it's going to work. I'll, I'll bet you. I mean, it's, uh, uh, every step here is simple. The interpolate, compared to your, your, your nearest neighbor stuff, the interpolation is no harder. <coughs> it really isn't. You know. So uh, we can talk offline, but it's not a hard thing to do. And his code is available. Yeah. So we'll never get rich. But, OK. So here's, for example, feature geometry. Uh, the best thing is look at upper right. Uh, sorry, right, the right column. This is the airplane versus the automobiles. Uh, how many dimensions are we talking about? <coughs> Six, 64 uh, dimensions. Uh, upper right is vanilla. Uh, lower right is our stuff. It's not a big, big problem. but. Uh, it uh, improves things a lot. And it makes a lot of sense. What you're trying to do is fit the data. Why not fit the data by interpolating the data and uh, seeing how close you can get? Okay. And everything else you just keep the same up until the last step. And we did the same thing with uh, that uh, adversarial training example, and we got much better accuracy, as you can see. 23% uh, accuracy improvement. Uh, again, it's a smallish problem, but what the heck? Okay. Uh, and here is uh, iteration. Uh, so uh, what, uh, much more stable under a different number of, of uh, iterations. Okay, so now comes the PS resistance. This is my favorite part of the talk. All right, here we go. What I'm going to propose is something mindlessly simple. Let's see, who invented gradient descent? Cauchy, is that correct? Uh, I think so. Uh, who knows history? What I'm going to do is give you something that Cauchy didn't think of, uh, which I promise you improves gradient descent like crazy. So something is wrong, because how did everybody miss this? Uh, either that or my ego is showing. He will find out. Okay. Here we go. Here's the idea. You want to find a better mirror minima of an empirical loss. We want it to have better, better, general, better generalizability and reduce the variance. And this was motivated by Hamilton Jacobi PDEs of all things. So if you don't know this stuff, you can zone out for a minute. But Hamilton Jacobi equation PDEs of, a, of this type, for example, if sigma was zero, that would be Berger's equation. You, how many of you have seen Berger's equation before? Many of you, of course. All right, so there you go. If sigma was zero, this would be Berger's equation. And what we're doing is thinking about the function that we want to minimize as the initial data for a Hamilton-Jacobi <laughs> equation, OK? And that function can be highly, highly non-convex and very high dimensional. There's a formula that gives you the answer. It's uh, due to Hoff and Lax. It's Lax did the 1D version, but anyway, he gets credit. He did a lot of great stuff. And what we're going to do is take a special Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Uh, take, take a look. If, if sigma was 0, just think about Berger's equation. Uh, so the exact solution to that equation, would you believe, is given by this in, infimum over here, which is a very classical, nice result, basically due to Hopf uh, a long time ago, Eberhard Hopf. OK, and what is sigma L is the question. So what we're going to do is translate this by doing two things. One, we're going to make L of W more convex. What does that mean, more convex? It's an arrogant statement. We're going to get rid of a lot of maxima and uh, local minima. And then we're going to do gradient descent in principle on this better function, which has the same minima. So this is a highly ambitious thing, and we don't really do it. We make some, many uh, simplifications. 
but it's motivated by this idea. Okay, so here we have a PDE. We have uh, initial data, and we want to do, uh, in principle, we want to minimize L of W. So we're going to minimize L of W by first thinking about a PDE, which takes this as initial data, and go from there. And this is skipped over in my other talks, because, but you guys are PDE lovers, some of you anyway, so I left it in. The viscosity solution satisfying that particular L, which I will define in a minute, does the following thing. It takes this crazy, this is five-dimensional, two-dimensional cross-section, the crazy oscillatory function over there, and as T progresses, it gets more and more convex in some sense. It becomes, it looks more and more like a, like a parabola. And that's the way Hamilton-Jacobi equations operate. You can take non-convex initial data with Berger's equation, uh, and, or Berger's likes equation, run the equation, and things get smoother and more convex. Okay? So what we're going to use that fact, I have a paper with uh, Adam Oberman and Pratik Chatori and a few other people, in which we did that for Berger's equation where the sigma was zero. It was a beautiful paper with all kinds of stochastic nonsense in there and everything. And it wound up, after all you do, it was the sigma equals zero case. And all it wound up doing was backward Euler. So we did this incredible great thing, and it turned out to be equivalent to doing backward Euler on the original function. You know what that means. UK plus one is UK minus the gradient at K plus one. That's very hard to do for non-convex functions, especially in high dimensions. So the idea was terrific, uh, and it got a lot, we got a lot of citations, but it didn't work that well. But this is what we do here. Instead of using that particular uh, value of Ber uh, that particular Berger's equation, we use this sigma L, which I will define in a minute. Uh, so just think about some operator applying, uh, applied to uh, the gradient of some function u. In this case, the first line is the gradient of a solution to the PDE. That turns out to be equivalent to implicit backward Euler uh, multiplied by this i minus sigma L inverse uh, for, uh, for the original function. So one more time, we take a function, we solve the stupid PDE, and then we do gradient descent on the function that evolves in time. That's the idea. We don't really do it, because if we really did it, we, we, it turned out we were doing backward Euler, and we'd be back up the same problem we had before. But by changing the operator, by replacing uh, the identity by i minus sigma L, which I will define in two seconds, I promise, wonderful things happen. And you can do explicit backward Euler, uh, forward Euler, sorry, with this modification. So after all this PDE mumbo jumbo, we arrive at a modification of gradient descent. And there it is. We take the function which looks like a tridiagonal discrete approximation to uxx, okay, or minus uxx. So what you see over here uh, is the identity minus sigma uxx discretized, okay, with periodic boundary conditions. And that matrix is easy to invert. It's a circulant matrix. It's constant coefficients. It has nothing to do with the function that we're minimizing. It's a given function from God or somebody. Uh, it came in a dream. And see, there's one parameter, sigma, which is positive. That's it. So the best function to use in gradient descent, as anybody knows, would be the Hessian. But if we could do the Hessian, we wouldn't be doing deep learning. So we're going to do something which is independent of the function. It only depends on one parameter. It's this matrix, which is tridiagonal periodic up there. And it can be solved by FFT. And if you don't like FFT because it's hard to parallelize, uh, you can use Sherman Morrison or God knows what all. But we do FFT. So we're going to take gradient descent and multiply by the inverse of that matrix. And then the world is yours. Wonderful things happen. Yep. Uh, no, it's defined on the gradient of f. Yes, that's right. So you take f, you take its gradient, and it's a very good question. We are not smoothing w. So the answer is no. It's applied to the gradient of f, period. With respect to these W's. Can you back up the equation for the Hessian? Sorry? Can you back up the equation that we were had for the 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have we have f of we have f of all these crazy parameters w. We just take a, a mini batch or something, and we take a gradient of that function with respect to w, and instead of doing gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent by taking you know a subset. We multiply by this matrix. Right. So you measure the final function. Uh, I, I, it's, it's on the gradient. Yeah, but we're not smoothing the parameters. Right, we're smoothing the gradient. Exactly, we're smoothing the gradient. Right. And that's the point. And here the punchline is, no matter what the gradient is, this is going to be smoother, unless it's a constant. You have precise definitions. Not only is it smoother, but this kills the variance like a madman uh, tremendously. And with no extra work, this is very easy to uh, apply. Uh, and this you should go home and try. I mean, it, uh, it's guaranteed to have smaller variance. And uh, lots of other. You betcha. It still, it still works. And we, the first thing we tried was exactly that. These things mean nothing. I mean, we, be, we can be taking gradients with respect to cats, hyenas, and uh, bow constrictors, and then rearrange them. Uh, it doesn't matter. No, however you've chosen them, this is going to be better. Precisely better. I will tell you how it's better. And the proof that it's better does not use probability, I'm happy to say. The proof uses Schwartz inequality over and over again, all these proofs, triangle inequality, stuff like that. The variance is smaller. Uh, the total variation, which is my favorite thing in the world, practically after, after level set, uh, is smaller. Everything is, uh, has gotten smoother and with almost no extra work. Moreover, the, uh, what's it called, the step size, which these lunatics call the uh, learning, what, what's it called? Learning. Learning. Yeah, say it again. Learning rate. Learning rate. I can't, I can't get, wrap my brain around this. It's just the step size. The step size has improved uh, in some sense because this is the inverse of a, a matrix which is bigger than the identity. So you don't lose anything. The only thing you use is, is FFT, period. That's it. End of story. Okay, so this is my favorite part of the talk. The paper got rejected by ICML. <laughs> yeah. I, we should talk offline because I, I don't know this stuff at all. So the answer is I don't know. What it does have something to do is if you were doing um, H1 gradient descent, which people have done, but that H1 gradient descent is applied to the Ws, not the, uh, not the gradient. So it's different. So it smells familiar and it looks crazy. I mean, we're just taking a vector which has randomly associated some you know, randomly or ordered way and improving it. And you can prove you you can prove you've improved it by integration by parts, which is the most important thing in math. It's uh, it's just uh, Schwartz inequality over and over again. So here's some examples. Oh, among the many things we claim without this, we claim without proof, but we have some justification is that this will do a much better job for non-convex problems. That's in, in, it, not only does it clean your car. I'm sorry. Not only does it uh, you know, uh, uh, give you better variance, which it really does. You can prove all that, but it does very well with non-convex optimization. And we have a little theorem about that with a, joint, with a very smart graduate student. So here's an example: a circumventing so a sharp minima. Uh, on the you see on the left is function which has these little minima all over the place, and we start out at the same initial data, and uh, our stuff hops over the uh, spurious minima and gets to the true minima. Same everything, same initial data, same, sorry, same uh, learning rate. I've got to learn to say that. And we hop over that. This is no proof of anything, but it's a good indication. 
Uh, here's convex optimization. Take a quadratic function, uh, which is uh, an ellipse, which has uh, crazy eccentricities. It's x, uh, AI is 1 if it's odd, 10 otherwise. Add Gaussian noise to the gradient to simulate a stochastic gradient descent. And uh, use uh, dear old Nesterov at times. So uh, what, I, what I advocate is whenever you have a gradient, including a Nesterov stuff, or a heavy ball, whatever you call it, use this. Very simple. And you can see that we go down like a shot and go down to the uh, better result of the various colors. Uh, and another possibility is, uh, let's see. So we have gradient descent, which is <coughs> the worst. Gradient descent plus Nesterov does OK. But uh, uh, we call LSGD. Uh, does better, and LSGD plus Nesterov goes down, boop, and stays down. Uh, and on the right, we take, we took the Laplacian, that matrix I told you. You can take powers of that thing. Uh, the only thing you lose is some kind of maximum principle and total variation, but you get more smoothing. So the, the, the world, I mean, so we're still not sure what the right value, a good question is what is sigma, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, we try various ver versions of, of sigma, uh, the, the algorithm is so fast you can play and, and see which one is best. So far, sigma equals one is what we start out with and usually works. Okay. Uh, but obviously, there's more to it. Uh, higher order means you take that minus Laplacian and square it and cube it and so on. And they're very easy to do. This is FFT. And you get better results, but they're a little more oscillatory. But you can see we get down to 10 to the minus 6 in some cases, for example. So we add a Gaussian noise to simulate SGD, and we do much better with this stuff. Okay. So here's some simple math pro uh, problems, which as a homework assignment you can do. Uh, if you take a sigma, apply, multiply, take d equals a sigma inverse of g. Take a sigma uh, d is equal to g. That means you're solving an inverse Laplace equation. When you solve Laplace equation, you smooth things, right? Okay. You just do. And the smoothing here gives you results that are mindlessly simple to compute. For example, uh, the, the, my, the first example is really a good one because it tells you that the forward difference of this function d, which is uh, the inverse Laplacian squared, is bounded. So you've smoothed the heck out of this function. It is strictly, and, the, and that inequality is strict unless d is constant. Okay. And moreover, you've got uh, the variance, which uh, is way smaller when you do this. So if you take this function, which is a gradient, with noise, or without noise, whatever, and you apply this matrix to it, the variance goes down like crazy. Okay? With almost no work, no averaging, none of the other stuff that people who do variance reduction use, no history, no nothing. Right in front of you, multiply by this matrix, Proceed, and good things happen. Lots of other things happen. Uh, proposition three is my favorite, but it's not uh, maybe the most relevant. It says the total variation of this vector d is less than what it was before. So you've denoised the sucker. Not only is the forward difference uh, to the first power less, but the forward difference to every power because the periodicity is less. So the L1 norm of the forward difference has diminished. But in, in particular, the variance of what people care about has gone down. Uh, and then you have a maximum principle and a minimum principle, and, and you preserve the sum. And all these things can be done in five minutes by integration by parts, or summation by parts. That's all there is to it. OK? And let's show results. Any questions about this? This doesn't prove as much as I'd like it to prove. It says that whatever grad f was, this guy is better. And don't forget, this is a positive definite matrix. So we have not changed the minimum if it's convex. So the only thing we have done is denoised, or smoothed, or shrunk the variance, or made it more convex, all of the above. Yep, at 10 minutes. OK, good. I'm pretty close. Any questions about this? I mean, again, it's hard to register. What we are doing is taking this gradient function, no matter what it was, gradients of with respect to any kind of crazy variables, and rearranging it by multiplying by this inverse matrix, and then just proceeding over and over and over again. That's all. And let's see what happens. 
Uh, so for example, here, here's softmax, and let's look at some results. So here is the, one of the, my favorites, variance reduction. We apply, uh, we call uh, LSGD, <laughs> that's the true gradient descent, and LSSGD with different sigma and batch sizes. To complete, we compute the full batch gradient, stochastic batch gradient, along descent paths. So now we have enough information for this small problem uh, to compute the maximum of the variance among 100 different uh, experiments. And I promise you this is what we get. For sigma equals zero, that is last year's Cauchy model. That is just gradient descent. Uh, for sigma equals one, we go down by a factor of 100 uh, in variance, all, all across the board, for different batch sizes. Uh, sigma equals two is more or less, uh, goes down by a little bit more and so on, sigma equals three and so on. So the maximum variance we get diminishes like crazy by using this stuff. And again, no history, no nothing, just using this thing. Okay, so we haven't proven that's gonna happen. What we've proven is the right-hand side has smaller variance and there's still more to prove, but I think we'll get it, okay? Uh, here's uh, SGD versus LS, SGD, uh, MNIST, and you can see, if you look at this, look at the graphs, uh, that the histogram of generalization accuracy is, uh, improves with increasing sigma. So going from, uh, on the first one, which is stochastic gradient descent, it sticks out 0.9, we get up to 0.92, which is not trivial for this problem, generalization. And the same learning rate. Here is a crazy Rosenbrock function, which is a good test case. And this is, this is a test case for me now, if I can make this thing work. Let's see. Oh, I got it. Okay. So if you use uh, uh, Nesterov with, a, with a, the same set size, it's almost unstable. It goes past it. But we get there first. This diagram was supposed to show that uh, LSSGD got to closer to the local minimum faster. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, how do I do that? Okay. He has a larger learning rate. Ah, oh, and Rosenbrook shoots off into outer space. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nesterov shoots off into outer space, and we get there first uh, for this non trivial problem. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep what's next? God damn. How do we go down? Here we go. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the fast conversions for high dimensional Rosenbrook. And uh, as you can see on the right, for a thousand dimensions, uh, gradient descent hasn't even started turning down. And we turned down pretty fast. Okay. Very good. And this is one of our best results. This is uh, generaliz generalization accuracy of, L of LE net with different batch sizes. And when you get down to batch size two, SGD is sort of random nonsense, and we get uh, almost full accuracy. So if you have a small amount of data, you can try this. And it really seems to work, okay? Very good. And here's a cute theorem, so I'm gonna end with a mathematical theorem. Which, what's Lisa's last name? I'm so sorry. Uh, Bao, what's her name? I forgot. Oh, there it is, okay, he <laughs> crossed it. We had a Swiss, actually, now that I think of it, a uh, graduate student who was visiting, and she read this stuff, and, she, and the idea was to show that our stuff avoids saddle points. And incredibly enough, she proved it. She proved a beautiful result, which is really hard to do for <laughs> this kind of uh, uh, dynamical system stuff. It's discrete dynamical system. What she did is the following. Instead of doing what we do, which is take a fixed sigma, she took that sigma and multiplied it by k plus one over k plus two, so it doesn't stay in the same direction all the time. And she did gradient descent with that uh, <coughs> sigma and proved something very nice, okay? It avoids saddle points. Uh, this is a, a two by two system, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's a learning rate 0.1 on a function x squared minus y squared. A function x squared minus y squared in 2D has a saddle point at zero, zero. 
If you start out at y equals 0, you will converge to the saddle point because you won't see anything if you use gradient descent. But we never go to the saddle point unless we start there. By fooling around with this sigma, she has proven that for two dimensions, uh, we never hit the saddle point. We never hit the saddle point. And that's very encouraging. So this thing has a tendency to avoid saddle points if you just change it a teeny bit. And that teeny bit is trivial numerically. It doesn't change anything. OK? Uh, and she also proves something even better, which is uh, if you have an n-dimensional problem, if we had x squared, summation xi squared, up except for xn was uh, a negative sign in front of it, uh, the dimension of the saddle point would be n minus 1. She has proven that this will give you a dimension n minus 1 over 2 uh, in terms of uh, likelihood of hitting it. So doing this stuff makes it harder to hit saddle points. And I've got two minutes, which is perfect. And this, this graph shows you that you escape the stuck region faster, and I think I'm finished. Uh, and there's a conversions rate, which I don't care about that much. It's no surprise. If F is L smooth, you, uh, LSGD gets to a uh, first order stationary point with these, this number of iterations, which is a conventional result, but still works for us. And thank you. That's it.